Well, I'm going to have to breathe this morning. God's given me three words to share. Um, and to be honest, it's three words I've battled with, I've hummed and hard with, I've struggled with, I've argued with, and I've fought God on, but the three words keep coming back and back, and those three words are keep it real. Now, that might not seem like a big challenge, but I know what that means. I know the story behind that, what he's asking of me, and I know the cost. That comes with that. So I kept questioning God, you sure? It's the 22nd of December, three days out from Christmas where we celebrate the birth of Christ, and his response was, yeah, I know that. (laughs) Of course you do. (laughs) Then he said to me, we're leading people on a journey to hope. Hope is not something, but hope is someone. And as a church, we've been really intentional about shaping up our our Christmas lead to Christmas Day about inviting people to find hope, to find Jesus Christ. And God is incredibly proud of that, and he's incredibly excited that there will be people who find Jesus. But then he said something that broke my heart. And he said, some of you, and I include myself in this bracket, that some of us are feeling a little lost, a little hurt, or even hurting quite a bit. Tired, angry, distant. Some of us are feeling more hopeless than hopeful. You know, sometimes we can go to church or work and we go through the motions detached from emotion. Sometimes we avoid those places because we can't be bothered talking to anybody. We don't want anybody to ask questions or we don't want to have to talk about what's going on behind closed doors. And so we stay away or we put on the mask and until we can pull ourselves together and make out that everything's okay. You know, at the end of a year, we try, quite often get worn out. We get burned out. We are hanging out for a break. And instead of being all happy, happy joy, joy inside, we, some of us just want to cry. We actually just want to push aside for a moment in time the hype that is Christmas and just be real. just to take some of that time and to let go. And and I believe God's saying it's okay. It's time to let go. We often use this time of year to reflect on the year that we've just been journeying in, the ups, the downs, the highs, the lows, and we take a peg in the ground and then we reflect forward or we look at 2020 and we decide this year is going to be a better year. This year I'm going to set some new goals. I'm going to make some resolutions. This year I'm going to be more of an overcomer. I'm going to have all these things in place. And we set these, like I said, these goals and resolutions. And then I read some interesting stats out of America that tell you that only 8% of people achieve their resolutions or their goals that they set. 80% of those people give up on day 12. Day 12, and I thought, God, that's got to be something biblical because the number 12 in the Bible is is really important to God. It speaks to our authority, authority and perfection. So I went and did a little bit of digging, not much. I found nothing. <laughs> so I come up with my own solution that people use this as a perfect time to exhort their authority. That let's quit. <laughs> so they take their 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 goal and their resolution and say, right, you know, this is too hard. I'm gonna just give it a go, just let it go. But it's a time of year, isn't it, where we, everything's chaotic. Who's had a spare day in their calendar in the month of December? It's, it's, it's absolutely crazy. It's a time of the year where it's all go, go, and it's all um, busy, 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 but it's also the time of the year that we're expected to be all, woohoo, it's Christmas, Merry Christmas, happy, happy, and yet inside you just want to go, because ah! the outside doesn't always reflect the inside. So when God asked me to keep it real, I was like, okay, God, but it's not very Christmassy. And God's like, you do remember what Christmas is about, don't you? He goes, it's not about the tinsel and the lights. It's not about the songs. Then he was mean and he said, it's not even about the food and the presents. I know. 
He said, it's about hope. And so God said to me, when you keep it real this morning, I'll bring the hope. Christmas is about my son. And I believe God said, I can't think of a better gift than to give my family hope and joy and peace and love. So I'm still unsure. (laughs) I'm still nervous. And so I still challenge God. And as God does uh, for most of us husbands, he uses the Holy Spirit, our wives, to, to tell us and to reassure us. Can I get an amen, men? Yeah. Oh, and the ladies got in there too. Um, Shani had a brief idea that I was going to share this message, but she didn't know the struggle and the battle I was having with God. And she said, you know, I read this amazing verse in First Thessalonians 2 the other day, and it said something about because we love them so much, because we love the people so much, that we're delighted to share not only the gospel of God, but your lives as well. And God was like, see, I even put it in Scripture. You love the people, I love the people, and as you share your message, share your life. So I gave up and let God win. But God, I want to ask you this morning. that your love shines for your strength, not just in myself, but those you want to speak to this morning. God, I honour you for who you are. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will have your way this morning, that our hearts are open to receive and to hear all that you want us to receive this morning so that we know the hope in Jesus Christ. Amen. So I'm going to share with you some stuff, and I've got a couple of disclaimers I want to make right at the beginning, that I'm not doing this out of a platform for for any sort of praise or any sort of, oh, you you poor guys. Um, Because this is not about us. This is about you seeing God in your journey. And the other thing I want to ask to protect my family is please don't go and ask us any more questions or look for any more information Um, because we have been going on a private journey. And uh, yeah, and and it's been hard. So I'm going to not share too much details, but just going to be real. Shani penned a blog post a few weeks ago that summed up our year that we've been privately walking as a family. But I want to also let you know that it was we decided to walk in wisdom to pull, pull other people in. We're not here to journey alone. And uh, we need people in our lives that we can share all details with, who can stand with us and pray. So when you go through a trial or you go through a struggle, you've got to have community. And church is the greatest place I find to find community. And I have been, we have been intentional about that. So if you are going through something, you Don't go alone. I think that's just biblical wisdom. And it's been absolutely amazing for us. So Shani penned the blog post and she titled it A Year From Heaven and A Year From Hell. We have seen God do some amazing miracles in our lives this year. And we've been blown away by his unconditional love. His love for us has been unquestionable. We have, I could stand here and tell you miracle after miracle that would blow your socks off you about the way that God moves when you surrender and just walk in obedience. But God's asked me to share on the other side, the year from hell. See, as a family, we have walked our hardest road yet. This year as a family, we have had to endure a private path that has broken us over and over again. I have cried like never before. I have hurt like I never thought possible. I have been so stressed in my life that I even started to lose my hair. You can laugh at that because my kids think it's hilarious. I get bald spots pop up in the back all the time. And so for quite a while, I kept my hair a little bit longer to cover that up. But my kids thought that was great arsenal for their jokes. And... Yeah, they constantly give me stick about it, and they're still there. 
I have never been so angry in my life. I have spent countless hours plotting revenge, having conversations with myself about what I would do and what I would say to people if I had the chance. Probably doesn't help the sleep. We have been blindsided over and over again. We have had people stick their nose in when it's none of their business and attack us. We've had people lie about us. We have been embarrassed. Some of us have lost some friendships. And I can tell you on more than one occasion that we just wanted to leave. We seriously considered just handing the towel in and walking away and shifting. It's been a very, very hard year for us behind closed doors. But I know we're not the only ones. Some of you can relate to some of those statements in your life this year of the pain, of the hurt, of the anger, of the frustration, of the hardship that you've had to endure. And God wanted me to tell you, you know what? It's okay. It's okay that you've been hurting and you're not too sure what to do with the pain. It's okay to be angry with what's happening in your life and to cry and to cry and to cry. Even if it's ugly crying. God knows. And I love that Jesus wept. In the Bible, Jesus didn't weep because Lazarus was dead. Because Jesus had already declared that Lazarus' sickness wouldn't come to death. And he knew what was going to happen. But Lazarus wept because the ones he loved were weeping and hurting. In John 11, 32 to 35, it says, When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He said, come and see my Lord. They replied, and Jesus wept. Jesus weeps out of empathy for those that he loves for the pain that they are hurting and the pain that they are feeling. And I love that, that through my tears, I know that Jesus is right there. Craig reminded me on Wednesday when I had a bit of a moment of freaking out and getting a little bit lost within myself. Um, He showed me, he reminded me of a movie scene that when you uh, see a lady that's generally been really hurt She's upset, she's overwhelmed by emotion and she goes up to the husband or the man and she just, he just embraces her and she's pounding on his chest, she's yelling, she's screaming, she is venting and all he does is hold her. He, all he's doing is validating her emotion. He's not telling her or directing her what she should be doing, he's just holding her in an embrace. And after a period of time, she slowly calms down and he's still got his arms wrapped around her. The sobs come a little bit quieter. She slowly breathes and she slowly collects herself and she feels drained of emotion, but better for it. I have to admit, I haven't always done that well as the husband. Because for me, I'm a fix-it sort of a person and Sometimes I don't acknowledge my wife's feelings as much as I should do and I try to fix them before I have to embrace her. And God's saying, I just want you to hold them and validate your emotions. Your emotions are very real. And God is like that to a father, as a father to us. He doesn't wait till you've pulled yourself together or have got yourself sorted. He wants to hold you through the anger, through the hurt, amongst all the tears and the colourful language that you may bring. God's not afraid of you keeping it real and keeping it raw because I think that's his favourite part because you're in his arms. And it's hard to love someone from a distance and God is inviting us this morning to press in. That's what sustained Shani and I through this journey and through our family's ordeal is that we have constantly gone to God. There have been many areas to our journey that you might be able to relate to. And so when our situation smacked us in the face for the very first time, and life does that, right? It can blindside you. It can take the wind out of your sails. It can sucker punch you. 
our first response is almost disbelief and denial. It, it takes a while for us to catch our breath. That first initial hit can be quite paralyzing. And sometimes our first response is not always the best response. And sometimes, uh, oh, probably all the time for me, if I had a little bit more time to collect myself, my response would have been a lot different to the, the knee-jerk reactions that we tend to have. But what I realized is that I started to walk in grief. And the first stage that I found out recently is shock and denial and grief. And I have been there. But the next that came really fast for me was anger. As a husband, as a father, I went into self-preservation mode. My walls went up, my barriers went up, my gloves came on, and my defense went into offense. You had to be very careful of what you said around me, or else I would have swung. And when you get blindsided and bl over and over again, and the hits just keep coming, you tend to live in this fight or flight mode. And as I said, we just wanted to leave. We, times we got tired of fighting. But when you turn to God, you, you know, he's your rock and your foundation. And I thought it was my turn to cause a little bit of discomfort. And so I started to plot revenges. Trust me, I have got so many scenarios that I have planned out that if I had the opportunity, I'm scared I would use them. I got angry at the unfairness. I got angry at the injustice. I got angry at other people. You know, I'm angry at the situation. I got angry at God. After all, wasn't he the one that's supposed to protect us? Isn't he the one that's supposed to stop these sorts of things from happening? And I think that's the Christian bubble that lies. Because God says we're going to endure trial. And when I'm standing there and I'm pounding at God, I'm angry. And he's just holding me. I realize it's not him I'm angry at. The Bible tells us not to sin in our anger, but it didn't say we can't get angry. Because your emotions are real. These questions and these scenarios, they're real. They go through your mind and they play over and over and over again. But he's a good father. And his arms are always open. And the one thing that God, one, one of the things that God wanted me to share with you this morning is that when you remember to go to him, you go to him face to face. Don't yell at God with your back turned to him. Because I, God is God and I want to still honor him. I want to still, I value who he is. That God is a big God and he can handle our, our rawness and our emotions. So despite how you feel, honor God. Because it's not him that's hurting you. It's him that's holding you. And then you can apologize after. I've done a lot of that. Oh. Then I moved into the next stage of, of grief, which was bargaining with God. <laughs> oh, God. This is when I start reminding God of, of what I do and who I am and, you know, whose I am. And, you know, I'm a pretty good Christian. I read, I pray, I even work for the church. I, I tithe. You've been there? God, why is this happening to me? And then I start comparing myself to those that are not in church. I'm better than them. I'm not doing that. God, please, if you can work out for me in this situation, I won't ask anything of you again. Yeah, I know the giggles because we've all done it, right? This bargaining with God. And it's in that space I forget, quickly forgot who I was talking to. God has already done everything for me. We don't have to look much further than the next three days to recognize that God gave his son for us. We don't have to 
look much longer than the 33-year lifespan that Jesus spent on earth and what he went through for us. But when it hurts and when it's gut-wrenching and when you're facing challenges and your emotions are real and the tears are real and the pain is real and it's physical, we tend to lose sight a little bit. And I believe God's okay with that because I'm still in his arms. I go to the classic verses about Romans, 20, about eight, Romans 8, 28. It was my go-to verse, you know, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purposes. God's got a purpose. God's got a plan. And this is all going to work out for good. God's already won the victory. We will see victory in our situation. Here's my mistake and what I'm still learning. It's my trust lesson. I decided what victory was going to look like and when it was going to happen. And so when it didn't come, when I thought it was supposed to come, back came all the anger, the hurt, the pain, the questions. <laughs> Once again, I found myself beating on God's chest. And we've been journeying this for over a year. And when I felt like God didn't show up, I was back to the beginning of shock and denial and anger. So many questions come up. And in God and his grace and his mercy showed me, took me to a podcast 55 minutes it was, and one line is all I needed to hear. God, good like that. This was the line in the podcast. I had to listen to it a few times. When did you get to decide what victory looked like and when it should happen? It was then when I realized that I'd taken God's promise of victory and decided what it was going to look like and when it was going to happen. And when, I, when God said that to me, I realized what I had done and I had repented and I had asked for his forgiveness. It was then that I was able to let go and let God come in and do what God wants to do. He knows the very best in every situation. He knows the best time to bring that about. And all I needed to do was to let go. Not hold on to expectations that I had shaped And then I was amazed to learn what the last little stage of grief was. Acceptance and hope. See, we have come to terms with what we're walking through. We have accepted it, though we don't like it and it's not easy. And the battle keeps coming. Two weeks ago, we got hit again. And the emotions go right back to day one and you keep going back to God. And again, go back to God. It's been our thing. And for some of you, this year has been very, very hard, emotionally, physically, spiritually. But if you're willing to accept that God knows, to accept that he has a plan, to accept that he loves you, to accept that he hears your cries, and if you're willing to accept that God will bring the victory in his time, and I can guarantee you that hope will follow. Hope comes when you surrender and let him in. Hope that points to an end and a, that the storm won't last forever, even though it feels like it. Hope that tells you that God knows and God cares. Hope that tells you that you're not alone because hope is not something, hope is someone and his name is Jesus. Shani and I and my family have only been able to keep pushing through on this journey because we have faith and we have hope in God. I know who my God is. And it's him who I keep turning to, him who I keep going to. It is him that I put my trust and faith in. So I stand here today. And you may choose to stand with me, but I stand here because despite of all, Despite the year that we've had, despite the year that you may have had, I choose to put my hope in Him. 
I choose to take the good, the bad, the ugly of my life to him. I choose to trust him for victory. I choose to honor him with my life. I choose God. I choose Jesus, who is my hope, who is my salvation, who is my Savior, and is my Lord and King. And my prayer for you, that you let him in. If it's been hard, stand and let him in. Because the greatest gift that he was to give you was hope of love and joy and a peace and a wrap and the cuddle of a father. That is my God. That is your God. So if you need a hug, I'm not looking for hugs today. If you need to just stand before God and let go, then let go and let him in. He's an amazing Father. He is your gift this Christmas. And I honour my Father. I honour my God. Have a Merry Christmas. And may God bless you with all of who He is, despite of what you're going through, because He is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. Amen. If you need a hug, Come and find me this morning.